our lecture. It's very exciting. So I have to say that um, this was the second summer that we were joined by um, the faculty, grad students, and undergrad students from the Fist Center of UMass Boston. And it has been an absolute joy to work with them. You cannot ask for a better team to work with. Uh, to sh they're so sh giving of their time and their expertise, uh, sharing their findings with us. And it's just been uh, a wonderful experience. And hopefully many of you were here last year for their presentation, but we have this one uh, coming up. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Krista Baranek. She is a historical archeologist with expertise focusing on New England in the 17th and 18th centuries. Her recent work has been um, excavating and studying colonial sites in urban settings uh, with a 10 year project that it took place or is taking place in Plymouth, Massachusetts to find the remains of the 17th century settlement prior to um, when she began the project here in Marblehead. Her laboratory focus is on artifact analysis, including the management and study of legacy collections. And for those of you who visit us this summer, you probably had the um, wonderful opportunity to speak with her about the project. So without further ado. And a raise point. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Lauren, and to everybody else. Um, it's really been uh, a wonderful experience working here and an honor to work on this project. It's an incredible site, as I think many of you know, and really just an incredible project. So um, as Lauren mentioned, I'm from the um, this Center at UMass Boston, which is a historical archeology span research center. Um, we do a lot of projects with historical societies and organizations like this one. And we also work with the MA program in historical archeology span at the university. So joining me tonight to give parts of the talk are two of the graduate students in that program, Mia Armstrong and Cal Mikowski. So I'm gonna give sort of the framing you know, history of the project and stuff. And they're going to talk about some of the research details of parts they've been working on. So I'm going to talk about the goals, process, some of the finds with an emphasis on the 2023 season and some of our major conclusions to date. And this is really all stuff that's, you know, hot off the presses. We're really still deep in the analysis. Um, so this is brand new uh, interpretation and presentation. And some of it's, you know, some of it we're still fleshing out the details. But as, as you know, the acquisition of the brick kitchen and the museum's larger interpretive questions about how the building was used uh, prompted the archaeology project. Because we know from some documentary sources that Lee held enslaved people, but we don't know much about their lives or their work. So the core of the archaeology project is to really to try and gather some physical data about the property during the Lee period, how it was laid out, how spaces were used um, to find things that were left behind, to tell the stories of all of the lives of all of the people who would have been on the property, both um, the Lees and the enslaved people who pass so sort of ephemerally through the documentary sources. But as probably many of you know better than I do, the Lee period is just one of the parts of the history of the property. And it's a relatively short period. Lee started acquiring parcels uh, in the late 1750s, construction in the 1760s, and his estate was liquidated in 1788. So archaeologically speaking, speaking, this is a heartbeat. This like 25-year period is very short. Um, but that's one of the, the challenging things and exciting things about archaeology is you really might, you really don't know what's going to be well preserved. So we have, we do also have to take a holistic approach to understanding the long-term history of the property. And that goes in the colonial period back to it being the home lots of the Jackson and James families, then the Lee period, then the Marblehead Bank and the dry goods store and the Lichmond, Lichmond property, um, and finally the museum. And what we have found over two years of excavation is that the property has really exceptional preservation for an archeological site in an urban area for several reasons. One of those is the 100 plus years of museum stewardship of the property. 
Um, but then some of Lee's actions have added to that preservation too, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. So archaeology is sort of a phased process, and I'm going to talk about our two years of work. We started in 2022 working on the space between the mansion and the brick kitchen and uh, around this, you know, one edge of the back of the house. And then in 2023, we swung around behind the rest of the back of the house and into the west yard and then came back to follow up on some things that we had found in 2022. The first thing we did in a lot of the images that you will see is we set up a geographic interest information system database so we can layer all of this historic data. So the aerial photographs, historic maps, excavation locations, field photographs, and all of this is tied into the state plane grid system so that anybody can find the locations of our work in the future, and we can find it again in future years. So a lot of the figures you see, you see come out of these, um, that system. And then in phases, we did geophysical investigations of the property. So two kinds of geophysics, ground penetrating radar and conductivity. And these are some of the results. This is one of the results next in the wet yard, West yard next to the mansion, and that's the, um, the uh, survey in process. And this helps us get a uh, look at what's under the surface. We followed up by doing shovel, what we call shovel test pits, small excavations, one and a half by one and a half feet or so. But even from these little tiny windows, we got a lot of information about the property. So these are the shovel test pit sized excavations. And then that got followed up in 2023. Some of those were places we came back to to open up into larger area excavations. So it's really a phase, phased steps of gathering different kinds of data, um, analyzing it and deciding where to come back to. And altogether, these are the excavation, these are the places we've done excavations. You can see we've done a fair amount between the mansion and brick kitchen and then sort of started to do small tests in the West Yard. Around this, we've been doing a lot of documentary research and a huge amount of, of lab work. There are, um, earlier this week, I um, did an export of the total data from the Lee Mansion. We have 35,000 plus artifacts from our two years of work at the site. So this is an incredibly productive site. We're not entirely finished washing and cataloging them all. So that number is gonna grow a little bit. Um, and the analysis that you're going to hear about is still very much in progress and, and is the latest results. And this, this lab processing takes a lot of, takes a lot of time. Um, so backing up to our, our sort of process a little bit, the, the geophysics on this property have been extremely successful. This is not always the case, um, but these are just two examples where we don't know what these things are when we see them in the in the slides we call them anomalies because until we dig them up we don't necessarily know what they are but the geophysics has worked really well here and so it's let us place these extremely targeted small test pits to get information about these features and i'll come back and talk about both of these um, as part of the presentation but this is the west yard this turns out to be a very early uh, drain water management feature sort of urban urban water management, and this is the early 18th century privy just behind the house. So extremely successful geophysics. Um, and we have results from many periods of the property's long history. But how do we connect specific batches of artifacts that we find to specific groups of people? One of the ways we do that, this is, this is the process part, one of the ways that we do that is that we excavate um, different layers of soil separately. So we pay very close attention as we go down to the soil changing color or texture. And these stratigraphic layers at the, at the Lee Mansion are very deep. We have never yet actually gotten to what would, one would think of as the bottom. We have never gotten to the bottom of the cultural deposits at the Lee Mansion. <laughs> so there was probably an ancient indigenous occupation of this landscape, we have just never gotten that deep. The deposits over there are so deep. And this is common in urban areas. Um, 
So we excavate each of these soil layers separately. The artifacts go into labeled bags, carefully labeled bags from each unit and soil layer. And each bag gets assigned a record number, which we call a context number. And we keep those all separate. And then we look carefully at the artifacts from each context. And some of the artifacts have diagnostic dates. So many of these ceramics, we know when they're produced, for example. And the ceramics in a context, context which are datable, help us tell us, give a date to the things like the animal bones, which in and of themselves aren't diagnostically datable, but because we found them with these ceramics, we can assign them to a date. So stratigraphy is one way, but the other thing we have to pay attention to is which part of the property we're, we're on. So in order to link specific artifacts to specific people, we have to know about the property history. So this is a map that the museum um, members produced. This is Stanley Goodwin and Copeland's map of the different parcels that Jeremiah Lee acquired to build up the land that now, um, or the land that he had. Um, and this is a slightly simplified version of that so that you can see that Lee acquired parcels from the Jackson family, the James family, and Freeman. Um, and that Freeman parcel had gone through a bunch of hands. It started out as the Nick land and passed through a number of other groups. And looking up here, you can see in our layered GIS map that some of these excavation units fall on Jackson land. And then just behind them, these excavation units fall on the Nick or Freeman parcel. So artifacts that we find here relate to one set of people and artifacts there relate to a different set of people. Um, so we have to pay attention to this property history. And I'm just gonna give you a short outline about the, the long-term colonial history of the property. Um, this is Sidney Curley's reconstruction of the land, of the land plots in Marblehead um, around 1700. And the man, the museum falls mostly on what is this little plot of common land here, just south of the William Nick property. Um, by 1700, this land was actually in private hands, but shortly prior to that, it had been common land. And then it goes through a series of different sort of interior divisions that change over time. The Jacksons acquired two parcels, this one with a house on it and this long one that was a meadow parcel. But then when um, the second generation of Jacksons died, oh wow, we're getting some fantastic colors here. The second generation of Jacksons died, the property got divided up in a different way internally between um, three different Jackson sons. Then Lee who agglomerated all of those along with the James land and the Freeman land and sold off some edge bits to a couple other people. So depending on when in time we uh, date a deposit to, it's, it changes who it's associated with also based on where. So why is and I said earlier that Lee's actions had an important role in preserving some of these earlier colonial deposits. This is, imagine you're standing out in front of this building and looking across the street, across Washington Street. This would be the Jackson House and James House. Washington Street slopes and probably sloped somewhat more dramatically in the past. The current property is very level, artificially level. And so you walk out the back door of the mansion and you have that, you know, retaining wall and like four foot drop off to the lower garden. That is there because Lee built it. So when Lee bought the property, he took this sloped property, demolished earlier houses, added a whole bunch of dirt to the Eastern downhill end to create this level stage for his house. So he built that landscape. Um, and the scale of the earth moving is really quite impressive because this is why we've never gotten to the bottom. At the downslope end, the 1760 ground surface is four to five feet below the modern ground surface. So probably all of the dirt that came out of the cellar that he was excavating um, and possibly earth from elsewhere went to create this big level terrace. The result of that is that we have really, really excellent preservation of an early 18th century landscape. Um, 
And this is unusual in urban areas. So I know that the main focus is the loop period, but this is these are all pre lee buildings and features. We have a house built by the Prance Jackson house with a little extension on it. We have an unknown outbuilding here. Then as you cross the lot line, we've got a blacksmith shop and another deposit that's probably related to blacksmithing here. Just up against the back of the Jackson property is the Jackson Privy. And then in the West Yard, where we've done a little bit less, we have this early drainage feature on um, the James family land. So we have this really dense urban landscape here between the mansion and brick kitchen, extremely well preserved because it got four to five feet of clean fill dumped on it in the 1760s. Um, so uh, just a couple details about some of those features. This bright red reflector here in the ground penetrating radar is this stone. It's like a French drain, essentially. Not sure what this one is. This was a very baffling reflector because it's huge. It's as long as the mansion. So too big to be a, an earlier building foundation. Really wasn't, weren't sure what that was until we excavated it. I'm not sure what this one is. It may be that because this was sloped, this is one of the foundations of the James house and they're trying to direct water rolling down the hill back off the property and not into the house. Unclear, but this is early urban water management uh, and you know drainage control here. We also know a lot about the Prince Jackson house because of a combination of the geophysics the documentary research and the archaeology. We have, um, so um, Philip Prance bought this little triangle of land, which he pretty much filled with a house. He bought the land in 1689, commissioned a house in 1690 with builders um, Jacob Knight and Timothy Goodwin. And then the contract, building contract, describes the house. It's to be 37 by 18 feet with a 17 by 17 foot cellar, two chimneys on the ground, one on the second floor, a whole bunch of other details about the construction. Prantz unfortunately died the next year in 1691 before he'd finished paying for the house. So the building contract ended up in his probate file uh, because it was a debt against the estate. Uh, and he was to pay for the house, interestingly, mostly with Barbados goods. Um, so sugar, probably, <laughs> mostly. Um, the Jackson family eventually bought the property a few years later in the 1690s. And then from 1757, we have Bartholomew Jackson's probate inventory describing the contents of these four rooms, the ground floor hall or kitchen, and parlor, and a second floor heated room, and another second floor probably unheated room. So a uh, really great documentation about this property, about this house, and then a bunch of artifacts associated with it. We also have, so we have a bunch of the Jackson family trash. And I should say that the Jacksons, um, they're two, two generations of physicians in Marblehead, so they have you know, sort of sidelines in the fishing industry, but mostly they're being listed in documents as surgeons and we see bills and debts and for, for them treating various people's relatives. Um, they're also Anglicans. They're among the founders of St. Michael's Church. So they're a relatively important and stable family in a sort of tumultuous early 18th century Marblehead, but they really um, don't, continue in any prominence after Bartholomew's death in 1757. His, um, the other relatives had moved away to Maine. Um, so they don't have a, a huge presence in later Marblehead, but were probably a pretty important family in early 18th century Marblehead. And we really have a fantastic deposit of early 18th century material from the Jackson Privy which would have been right at the rear of the property line and is just behind, you know, just out the back door of the mansion there. This is a, another very deep feature. Um, it starts at multiple feet below the ground surface. So I think that's Cal in the excavation unit there. And we're just getting down to the top of the Jackson Privy deposit. So all that stuff that we've done to get there is fill that we added. 
because that it's where well preserved and really quite wet, which helps preservation. <clears throat> we have it has a, a wealth of artifacts in it. We've brought some of those um, with us today. We're really just getting started on the analysis of these, but this is it's an early 18th century collection, 1690s to early 1730s. Um, and these are a few of the, the sort of the standout artifacts in there. We have a number of pieces of Caribbean-made sugar pottery. These would be the sugar cones and molasses drip jars um, that may have come up from Barbados or another island in the Caribbean and were probably made there. We have a fragment of a wheel engraved tumbler, which I believe has a ship design on it. I'm looking at some more intact examples. Um, and a number of marked smoking pipes with an I.I. in a cartouche. <clears throat> These were produced by James Jenkins in Bristol, England, starting in 1707. So that helps us date the material in this feature. But the really standout collection from this is the animal bone. And if you look at the amount of animal bone in the Jackson Privy, as opposed to the site as a whole, Overall, at the whole site, animal bones make up about 28% of the collection. In the privy, there's 60% of the collection. So that whole, you know, that whole wedge there is animal bones. Um, and there are also a really lot of pipes, smoking pipes <laughs> in the privy, <laughs> and in the Jackson deposits generally. And enough so that that I'm we're thinking that it may have had something to do with early 18th century medicinal practices when it wasn't quite clear, but maybe smoking was good for you. <laughs> it was used to treat certain kinds of lung conditions, thinking that it maybe made your lungs drier. Um, so I, we don't know that for sure. And one of the potential future projects is to actually do some sort of residue analysis and see if it was tobacco or something else that was being smoked. Um, but the faunal collection, the animal bones are really the outstanding material here. And Cal Mikowski is working on studying the animal bones for her master's thesis. And she's gonna come on up and tell you a little bit about the research and what she's learning from these animal bones. Hi everyone, thank you all for having me. And like Krista was saying before, thank you all for so kindly being supportive of this project. It's been a really, really exciting project to work on. Truly an absolute treat of an archeological project to work on. Just so many things and we're very, very excited to work with all of them. But that brings us to all of our animal bones, which there are so many, as Krista was saying, um, over 60% of the materials from the pretty being fauna. So we have quite a big collection to work with, which is incredibly exciting because fauna materials are often, because they're organic, they're bones, they often decay faster. So we, depending on the conditions of preservation, don't have as many typically. So it was really exciting when you have this big, rich deposit of fauna remains to work with. But if any of you are here from last year, or and for those of you who were not here and are curious about it, they, in last year's, well, rather, the 2022 excavations, they had hit part of the top layers of the privy. And that was incredibly interesting to see because you think Marblehead, a fishing community, is going to be dominated by fish bones. It is not the case by any means. And beyond that, um, often on sites based on preservation rates, mammal bones tend to preserve more than fish, bird, and any other kind of remains. So we were thinking that probably mammal remains would be the most. Turns out birds were. Birds, one of those categories of um, animal bones that preserve usually at a lower rate compared to mammal bones and other more like hardy, robust bones. So this is one of those ongoing questions we have along with some other ones from last year. So mainly those questions being, why is there so few fish? If we're in a fishing community, um, why are there so few mammals, especially if that, they're standard for the diet? And why are there just so many birds? <laughs> so we have some of those kind of ongoing answers. And as we continue to excavate the pretty, some of those things came more to light as to the reasoning behind them. And we'll get into those as I kind of talk a little bit more. But overall, to give you the kind of that's the recap, and then moving into the fall remains from this year. I would like to emphasize that all of the bones that you will see today, and all of them I'm discussing, are from animals. They are related to the kitchen diet. Of the, oh, sorry, the kitchen kitchen waste are related to the diet. So likely they are eating meals 
or butchering animals to then eat or prepare for a meal and then throwing into the privy. The benefit of the privy being that there is a lot of really excellent preservation. So we have a really big and like a really excellent look into the diet. One of the ways that we look at this is considering the number of identifiable specimens that are in the collection. So in deposits that are a little bit different that you'll hear more later on, so like a trampled yard surface where someone's walking across a yard where you're throwing animal bones, they get a lot more fragmented. So we're taking into account here that these are a little bit less fragmented, so we have a lot of opportunities to actually identify these bones. And we also consider how many individuals are in the actual deposit. So if you think about it, you have two of each of your arm bones, you have two of each of your leg bones. That's the same thing in animals. So we consider all of the different skeletal parts that kind of go into an animal. Um, a big thing I like to play is mystery meat with my advisor, where you consider it as it's a mammal, a bird, a fish, in some cases a reptile or something even stranger. Um, and we also consider how old the animals are because animals that are younger typically tend to be considered a little bit more expensive high class foods because they're not quite your older animals who are a little bit tougher and not nearly considered as tasty. We also look for butchery marks, which you'll see some good examples of in a later slide, but considering how are they processing these animals and potentially what meals could they be preparing with certain types of meat. That being said, from this year, we have a lot more mammal bones. And that's likely due to, as we've just gone down, the overall assemblage is dominated by animal bones so far. I don't have exact percentages because this is, as Krista was saying, a really ongoing process as part of my research, but the majority of these bones being from mammals this time around, that being said, they might not necessarily make up the majority of the diet. We'll have to continue working with those stats and those final results will be part of my thesis. But the majority of animal bones, um, the majority of mammals rather, are coming from goat or sheep, which are often really hard to tell the difference between archeologically, so we group them together as one class as kind of cat breeds, these kind of goat and sheep, and then also a lot of cattle as well. Um, we have a lot of younger individuals within this privy, which is really kind of indicating that this higher end, like this higher end diet that's probably being consumed by these more, like Krista was saying, kind of stable, a little bit more prominent members of the Muggle-head community. So we have a range of limb bones, ribs, among other little bits, some vertebrae indicating that they were probably doing some butchery on the site, but most of it probably would have been purchased in a market or from a butcher nearby, and then they would have been doing some secondary butchery at home to process these cuts of meat for certain dishes or to serve at their table. Um, the fact that we have both limb bones, so we have entire bones, for example, this one in the top left of the slide, an entire cow, uh, entire um, leg bones, so this would kind of indicate they're eating leg of lamb. Meals along those lines, which are considered typically pretty expensive and high end at the time. But then we also have more of these fingers and toe bones, these phalanges, which are indicating that they probably were doing some butchering at home and then throwing those byproducts into the privy. We also have some really good examples of butchery marks within, um, within the privy, so I have highlighted some of them to kind of give you an idea for what we look for and what that can indicate about how they're processing their meals and serving their meals, as well as just the typical environment. So we have highlighted in the center cuts and chops, which are very often associated with actually slicing the meat off of the bone as you were to serve it. So oftentimes these meals serving giant pieces of meat at one time as kind of this really big display of wealth, if you think almost like a very late like medieval feast where they're serving like a lot of really tiny birds all together in one kind of big elaborate display or like an entire leg of an animal on your table. Cuts and chops are often associated with slicing that meat off of the bone and then serving it to people as your kind of like as part of your big display. Shears are something that are often associated with just kind of, they create this really flat surface so it would be the process of separating limbs and joints from each other. And then we also have some evidence of carnivore gnawing in the privy. So, Likely that some wild carnivore, likely a coyote or something along those lines that are just around native to this area is chewing on it. Or if the Jacksons have any pet dogs, this could indicate that they might be throwing scraps to a pet who's then chewing on it and then it's getting pushed off into the privy or if it's getting thrown into an open privy, any wild kind of critter in falling into that carnivore category would have access to kind of gnaw at it. 
Oftentimes we see along in privies, we see rodent gnawing, which is very distinct looking from carnivore gnawing. And that is not something I have a good picture of because we don't have a lot of it, which is pretty interesting for the privy because typically they're associated with being not the cleanest of environments where you have a lot of little pests running around. So the fact that we don't have much, or at least of the things that I really in depth look for this kind of carn uh, this rodent gnawing doesn't exist indicates that they may have been filling it in really quickly after, but time will tell with that. Like the um, the previous results I had presented, there are still quite a bit of fish and bird remains, which is not exciting now that we I understand a lot more about this diet that the Jacksons were probably trying to emulate. So at the time, really popular to serve a big variety of birds as part of a really fancy high-end meal, and this is basically attempting to copy a really late medieval diet in Europe. So they're trying to copy all of the high-end gentry over in England and kind of putting their own spin on it here in the colonies as they begin to kind of navigate the changing social environment. Um, we have a lot more fish as well, which is not that surprising because we're in a, obviously a very predominantly fishing community and the Jacksons do have some ties to the fishing industry. Um, the variety of bones we have indicates that it's probably something that they are cooking on their property and they're having a whole fish because we have all different parts of the fish represented versus just vertebrae or just rays that would be associated with a fillet or something along those lines. But this preservation being better in later, uh, lower levels of the privy rather as we got down is probably just because of some disturbance that would have been in the top layers. But overall, the privy providing us a really good environment for the preservation of bird and fish remains, which typically don't preserve as well on other types of deposits. We also have some more interesting little specimens. So this is what I refer to as the slide of weird things, because <laughs> these are the more untypical or really particularly special artifacts that we have from here. So we have some remains from really, really young pigs. So that top um, mandible, that jockey from like a really tight, like a really baby pig. We also have a fetal pig in here which indicates that they probably had slaughtered an animal that didn't realize was pregnant, either because they just weren't paying attention to it or they didn't have to worry about something like that versus someone who may have been a little bit not as, I'm trying to think of it, like if they're not as worried about money, they wouldn't be as worried about slaughtering an animal that's pregnant versus someone who needs more piglets to produce more meat and to have that animal for future products would be a little bit more concerned about slaughtering a pregnant animal for lack of better words. We also have some remains in here that indicate just how good the preservation of the privy is. So the eggshells and fish scales in particular are not something you see incredibly often. We have one of our lovely undergrads to thank for all of these because she was incredibly meticulous with screening things and through also some other samples we took that involved floating soil samples that we recovered some eggshells and fish scales. We also have otoliths, which are ear bones that are found in fish. And these are incredibly exciting because they allow us to actually identify fish to the specimen, which is often a lot harder to do with just vertebrae and rays. And now that we have a much bigger assemblage of fish, this is really exciting because it's something that we will be able to identify at the species level. We also have a sturgeon scoot, which is one of these kind of cartilage, like, a little bit more of like a bony cartilage plate that's found in sturgeons. Sturgeons being really exciting because they're often associated with being uh, the fish of the uh, like the fish of like the kings in England. So having this is one of those ways that you could indicate your wealth and status through your diet. And then we also have some possible shark teeth, which I think might be one of the weirdest, more interesting <laughs> specimens in the privy. Not entirely sure if they are shark teeth or not. We are going to be bringing these more interesting pieces of the collection to another archaeological kind of comparative collection that allows us to identify them more. But sharks being mostly made of cartilage, shark teeth are one of those things that would preserve better than others. So this is an indicator of the shark in the privy for some reason. <laughs> but I'm not entirely sure why yet. So if you have suggestions, please let me know. But kind of another avenue of research that's ongoing as to why this would be here and they might be convenient. Shark fin soup is a delicacy in some places. So that is one of those other avenues of research that's continuing to be ongoing. But on that topic, 
This is a very, very preliminary identification of fauna remains by class within the Pirinii. So we have some in this unsorted category, which I'm not entirely sure how to classify them yet. But overall, the majority of these animal remains from the Pirinii, in terms of the actual number of specimen, are mammals. We also have some bird, some fish. The shell preservation is pretty good, which is exciting because that's also one of these kind of fall types that aren't the most well preserving. And then we also have a decent amount of loose teeth, which indicates that they're depositing some type of skull and cranial kind of things into the privy, which is one of those indicators of them actually butchering on the site. So probably more along the lines of they're purchasing a partial animal and then further butchering it on their own property to then serve. Um, these other kinds of um, avenues of research I'm looking into is just why there are so many goat and sheep limb bones. And this is probably due to the fact that they're serving bigger pieces of meat as part of these more like elaborate meals possibly. Um, and one way of exploring that is through cookbooks. So The English Housewife is a really popular cookbook in the 17th century, published in the 1620s, but remains incredibly popular, popular in both England and then as folks are coming over to the colonies, it is one of the more popular cookbooks. So this has been serving as a primary source for me as I begin to dive through all the different ways that they would prepare leg of lamb and all the different ways to prepare birds from basically their have recipes for how to prepare piping clovers up to goose, chickens, the more domestic common fowl that we eat today. So this is kind of this avenue of research that I'm taking. And this all feeds into 18th century meals and what they mean for kind of interpretation and what this assemblage can tell us. So food being an incredibly important social tool at this time, where it's one of these ways that you can display wealth is through how fancy and how elaborate the meals you're serving. As I was kind of mentioning earlier, this idea of you're attempting to copy the really fancy meals of the aristocrats over in Britain and adopting it to fit basically your social world and the messages you can use to portray through your food, essentially. In particular, I am taking a view of it through Mary Jackson. So George Jackson's wife, it's her fourth marriage when she married George Jackson in 1690, and she is born in Salem in the 1640s. So she is a lifelong resident of Salem and Marblehead throughout her varying marriages. So she has this in-depth knowledge of her community and all the different social kind of that she knows how to navigate her social world. Um, she also would likely have been the one deciding what meals to serve and how to serve them. So she would be the one choosing what particular cuts of meat and how to prepare them and what dishes to serve them on. And she would be the one to understand all the different social cues that you can get from how you serve a meal and all of these other different factors. So looking through almost the eyes of Mary Jackson to understand this assemblage and the messages that the Jacksons are able to present to themselves, to others, and then through this. Um, one of these big kind of things to consider with this as well is the idea of luxury foods, which are often considered archaeologically. They're defined as foods that are either hard to find, they're considered exotic, so not native to this the area that you're examining, um, foods that would be hard to prepare, require specific knowledge to prepare them, restricted to people who can access them. So the reason why birds being such a hallmark of an elite diet in England is that they are restricted as to who can hunt them. So you would have to own property in order to actually hunt and capture these birds and then serve them. And this becomes a bigger trend as people are diversifying their diets as a way to express their status. Um, also foods that would be present in excess. So having a large number and large range of birds would be considered among other types of foods that are available in excess and present in excess would be the hallmarks of this kind of luxury diet. Another example of this would be considering the age of animals. So young animals in particular being more costly to consume, not only because the cost of butchering them is considered to be higher because of the actual process behind it, but also if you slaughter an animal when they're younger, you don't have to, that animal to raise for the rest of their life to produce other products such as like milk or wool or any of these other animal products that would be considered incredibly useful. Um, 
In particular, these images here, we have a nice image of Mary's headstone, which is in the old burial ground. Um, and I paid for a nice visit in the fall to thank her for putting all of her stuff in the ground. <laughs> to rest it up. But these are some good images of what meals typically were like at this time. So these really large spread and elaborate displays kind of on the bottom, especially emphasizing the, the presentation and the yeah. emphasis on these kind of more exotic birds, as well as at the top, it is, I know a little more of a graphic image, but it is a, it's basically a rack of ribs from a lamb and a lamb's leg among some other birds. And this is kind of, these genre of paintings oftentimes considered to be an, essentially an indicator of how someone very wealthy would set their table. So this kind of is one of those other primary sources to consider as we begin to piece through the funnel assemblage. But on that note, I leave you with the themes of women's knowledge, how you uh, how you create and present your identity, and just how you do that through meals as I turn it back to Krista. So that's our sort of our early 18th century focus. And I'm going to, we're going to save the lead period for the very last. So I want to show you a couple slides from our 19th century finds before we come back to the lead period uh, as sort of the cap, the cap of this. We got to do some really interesting indoor archaeology. Um, this is the basement of the mansion. Um, Lauren had noticed these sort of edge bricks in there. So we cleaned this off and photographed it and then uh, took it out and you get these two um, bases of probably a mid 19th century heating system. There's a lot more we can do to specifically identify this. And we had some help in the field from an architect for identifying this kind of heating system. Um, it was definitely part of this. Some of the rubble that filled these in was like these pieces of marble that are very similar to the marble that's around some of the fireplaces upstairs. So part of renovating the the you know heat, heating system in the mansion in the 19th century. We also found a late 19th and early 20th century privy in the garden bed right at the back here. This is another feature that we found because of the geophysics. This was a brick uh, brick constructed privy that was parched and had a, a hard bottom and was filled with um, probably a very end of the bank or very beginning of the museum collection of planting pots, whole bottles, um, teacups in both sort of very fancy porcelain and very utilitarian whiteware and a couple other plates. So this is represents maybe the very earliest activities at the museum being thrown out and filled in the maybe the teens possibly. So this is the you know, the garden club 1.0, you know, 0.0 .0 or 1.0 <laughs> um, assemblage. Um, and then we have a great collection from people who definitely like dropped things on the ground outside. The children who lived at the bank in the families of the tellers in the late 19th century. The head tellers and their families lived at the bank throughout the century. And a number of these had children in their families. The Treffries had children and the Reynolds family, who was the teller between 1872 and 1904. William, the, the William Reynolds was the bank teller and uh, his wife Elizabeth had four children, two boys, two girls, all under 10 on the 1880 census. So they all grew up at the mansion. Many, most of them were born while they were here and they all would have grown up on the property. And we have a wide assortment of things from them. We've got a little tin soldier. We've got a ceramic frozen Charlotte doll. We've got, these are two of a number of different marbles, a number of different doll sized or child sized tea dishes, um, slate pencils, pencil leads, and one um, wooden and you know metal, like your typical pencil pencil. And this one, I'm not sure that it's legible in here, but this actually is a metal tag that says Eliza Reynolds and was found um, on a dog burial that we found in the lawn. So she buried her pet dog, a large, a quite large dog um, on the West Lawn. And we just happened to find that in one of the test pits. The dog is still under the West Lawn. We left the dog in place, um, but we did take the metal and leather collars for conservation 
and it says Eliza Reynolds um, and license 206. So if anybody has <laughs> the historic Marblehead dog licensing <laughs> records, <laughs> yeah, read a dog and the dog's name. I have not actually been able to find those, um, but they do probably exist. So this is our, we have a little bit of a, a 19th century story here too, and much more to get into about those. But I now want to turn to the Lee period, and Mia is going to talk about the different deposits that we actually have from these two years, mostly from 2023, that relates to the Lees. Hello, my name is Mia. I have had the pleasure of working for Krista as her research assistant for the past year, and I also have the pleasure of working out here this summer, which, as Krista said, it's an amazing site. There's so much to see, so much to learn. I saw stuff I've never seen before. It's great. And so we're going to talk about the Lee period, which, as Krista noted, pretty difficult to see archaeologically because of the short duration of it. But one of the most, the most exciting thing and the most like present thing I think we found out there as evidence of the Lee period is the formal cobbled surface, which was found across the eastern yard and spans pretty much the, or it spans the entire area between the brick kitchen and the mansion, and then also in the back of the mansion, all the way back there. So um, the surfaces are really shallow. It's, that's just proving how shallow the leaf period is in this site. Um, most of the place we found it like 10 centimeters below the surface. So very shallow very apt to be disturbed by modern landscaping, which it has been in a couple places. Um, we have yet to discover formal ends for the cobble surfaces, so we don't actually know where they terminate, we just know where they are. And the presence of these cobbles has many implications for both construction of the mansion as well as the operation of the mansion when the Lees and their enslaved laborers occupied the property. So these cobbles were likely taken from the nearby Marblehead coastline and brought into town during the home's construction, which is an enormous labor cost for those constructing the mansion, which like think about, you know, going to the beach and grabbing a big cart of rocks and dragging <laughs> it up that hill up there. Yeah, it's like pretty, I would say pretty difficult. And the presence of this cobbled surface um, added to the opulence of the grounds and kind of added like a, it's like a physical manifestation of the Lee family's wealth, essentially. Um, and of course, the Brick Kitchen, as we all know, has been referred to in 19th century documentation as quarters for Lee's enslaved laborers. And that this cobbled surface was likely a huge part of their life and in their daily kind of traversing between the mansion and the Brick Kitchen. Um, they also, it was likely an area they probably had to maintain as part of their duties, sweeping up trash, keeping the cobbles clean, and yeah, so that is, it's like a big part of understanding the landscape of the grounds during least time. And something we noticed upon kind of bringing all these pictures together and seeing this all at once is you can see these little arrows I put on there. All of this is like how the cobbles are oriented. And you'll notice that in different areas across different places, it's all different orientations, which could indicate a variety of things. It could be internal subdivisions within the yard that the cobble directions were built in to kind of indicate these different areas, or it could be some kind of design, which we wouldn't really know until so. That's what I'm going to say is like further investigations probably could help us understand more about like what the construction of this cobble surface was, what it could have, like what the designs were, if there were subdivisions within the yard, et cetera, et cetera. And so this cobbled surface is very informative about the lived experience of those existing within the landscape surrounding the mansion during the leave period. But it also kind of makes our job as archaeologists a little harder in certain other ways. So I mentioned earlier that enslaved laborers could have been responsible for sweeping and maintaining the cobbled surface, which in turn effectively removes the possibility for true Lee period trash buildup to both the eastern and northern yards. So essentially, because 
we're archaeologists and we make our conclusions based off of trash. That makes <laughs> our job a little bit more difficult because if there's no trash, what are we going to make conclusions based off of? So in order to kind of investigate that and be able to make these conclusions, we expanded, we looked at some of the deposits we had found within the West Yard of the mansion, and which at the time, Lee's period was, as indicated by this map, or drawn from deed research, it was a farmyard, essentially. And so these are yard deposits, and we decided to look into these yard deposits to see if there was indication of any Lee period trash build up there, which we found in, you can see circled in yellow, kind of to the like bottom left or the bottom right of the map is the southwestern part of the yard is where we've ended up finding three very promising or four very promising deposits that could indicate leap period activity. So essentially, this, because of the way the leaf period is, and because of the construction of these deposits, it's a little bit different than like what Cal was talking about with the Jackson period privy. So a privy deposit is a little bit more easy to tie to like certain occupations or certain bound it by certain time periods. But since this is a yard that was continuously used and is still used today, people are still walking through it and dropping stuff in it all the time, <laughs> which we know because we found stuff that people probably dropped in there like yesterday. <laughs> um, so yard deposits are a little bit, have a lot more potential to be more mixed and are a little less like bounded in time. Therefore it requires like what I, so what I ended up doing is Krista talked about how we use context to kind of separate soil layers in order to isolate artifacts, like the group of artifacts from that specific soil layer. What I then did is essentially looking at ceramics, which have date ranges of production and when they were popular. Other objects like glass and metal can also be really indicative. Essentially looking at all these patterns and other artifacts present, I was able to kind of generate. So there's a formal dating method, which you can see MCD and MCD and TPQ. That is a mean ceramic date, which is generated kind of from looking at the big collection of ceramics using their date ranges. Gen you do a bunch of math, you generate a date. It's not always, and then TPQ, which is where you look at the date of what is kind of the, I guess like the youngest, the early or the whatever is the earliest or closest to the present, you know, I'm trying to explain this. Is that, yeah, like based on artifact dating, it's whatever would be the most modern, but that could be, you know, obviously you can see my TPQs are pretty, you know, historical. So, but basically I'm very bad at explaining that. But essentially these are like more formal dating methods. They're not always super useful, especially in contexts like these where a lot of these were shovel test pits and not excavation units. So the sample sizes are a little bit smaller and can get skewed more easily. But essentially I did that, but also just generally you can tell from like an understanding of what ceramics might've been used in the lead period or earlier or after that. So essentially just looking at these artifact deposits and kind of generating a formal date, but also kind of just knowing what would make up a typical Lee period deposit. And then I went through and I kind of visual, I helped you guys visualize like what these deposits looked like and how varied they are. It's a lot of different stuff. It's not just ceramics. It's not majority anything. It's most, it's like a lot of mix of stuff, which again, it's a yard, it's a yard deposit. A lot's going on there. There's a lot of activity. So a lot of different things are represented here. Um, the level one, I'll just, you can see this right here. That's me indicating that there was definitely mixing in this deposit because there's two pieces of bottle glass that are definitely modern. And there's also that like rod thing is a battery core, which I don't think Jeremiah uses this <laughs> battery. So I don't think that's from really curated. But, and then, but it's mixed in with ceramics that definitely were from the late period, like creamwares or white salt glazed stoneware. 
And then going further down, there's other objects, including this jaw harp, which in the South, these have been um, connected with context of enslavement. Of course, I don't, I don't think, I don't know if that's necessarily the case here, but I definitely know that it has been in the past. And, but I mean, I can't attribute it to an enslaved person on this property because like I said, yard deposits represent so much activity that it's really hard to tell. But, and then going further down, again, this is where we get into something that could possibly be older than the late period. Because again, the late period is very shallow. We were finding most of like, the biggest concentrations of artifacts within the first 20, 30, 40 centimeters. So here is another one of these tests. Or the, this one is an excavation unit, which is why it has a little bit more stuff in it. Um, again, there is, there's a thimble. There is a fish hook. There's a red pipe bowl, which again, in the South, these have been also been uh, connected with context of enslavement. I know in the North, it's a little bit more argued that these are probably traded as opposed to actually generated by enslaved people for use here, but there it is. And um, again, there are two more pieces. Again, there's mixing down here too. There's some pieces that look a little bit more modern or like a little bit younger, I guess, than others, but generally speaking, again, very much so older than the late period. And then finally, I say this is the deposit that we believe has the, it had the most, like there was the most concentration of artifacts here that seemed the most promising to be late period later. This is an area we would like to go back and investigate, SCP-2324. Um, this is where, again, proper types of ceramic like assemblage, there's some buttons, this lead um, stamp thing, pipe stems, and then as you can see, even like within for like when you get to like the 50 centimeter level, it already like very steeply drops off and becomes something becomes likely older than the leaf period. So yeah, the leaf period very shallow very concentrated in the top and also likely somewhat mixed with other stuff, mostly the early bank period, et cetera. And so thinking about this as a farm deposit or a farm yard deposit, something else that was a big indicator. So I was talking about, you saw the pictures of the ceramics, they're all pretty fragmentary. That was also true of a lot of the faunal remains, which were found here. Um, SCP 2324 had the best preservation for faunal remains, which essentially means that pieces that might not normally save well did save well there. Those, all the pieces that indicate preservation have a blue star beside them, including this, which I'll hold me, is apparently actually like a cartilage piece. So the fact that that survived there means the preservation is fantastic. Um, and then these yellow stars here are indicative of what could have been the Lee period diet, which appears to be a lot of cow, goat, and sheep, and pig. So pork, beef, mutton, you know. And um, so again, these are pretty frag it's fragmentary. There's butchery marks, which indicates that this could have been an activity area. And Again, just contributing to the idea of this being a farmyard, an active farmyard, and a possible place for trash dumping, which could have more to reveal in future excavation. So basically, the 2023 season was really good for identifying um, potential leave period activity areas. Our major results of 2022 were that we learned that we've got a really great early 18th century landscape, deeply buried, uh, mostly on the east side of the house. And this is an important period in Marblehead's history also, and we'll learn a lot from that. But then our major um, conclusions from 2023 were that we learned a lot about the leave period landscape. So this cobbled surface probably covered the whole area between the mansion and the brick kitchen and most of the area north of the mansion. So this formal, clean surface. 
And the West Yard, on the other hand, instead of being the sort of beautiful garden it is today, was a working yard in front of the barn where trash was getting thrown out and trampled. And so that means we might actually find trash deposits there. And we have some, some of that trash suggests the kind of activities that might have been taking place there. There are thimbles and buttons that suggest washing or sewing. There's the mouth park. Um, there's the animal bones with butchery remains. So all of these are activities that might be taking place. And we have only really small test pits over there. So that was sort of our early phase and could we could potentially learn more, um, particularly along the, this west edge right here. This was the test pit with the really great remains. There are a couple other Lee period questions that we want to follow up on. So sort of where do we go from here? There's a really big difference between this test area and this test area, which aren't very far apart. So here we've got this shallow cobbled surface and there that's a full length shovel and it's all the way down in and we're still in 19th century deposits. Mm -hmm. And that was really characteristic of everything through the knot garden, through this garden, which is the presumed area of the Lee barn. So some kinds, there was something there that didn't get filled in until the 19th century. So a barn with an understory perhaps that had a, a level, one entrance opening to the yard surface here, and then a deeper like basement story possibly that doesn't get filled into the 19th century. So we really like to bridge the gap between these two test pits and figure out where do we go from formal car cobbled yard to deep 19th century deposits. And we have some geophysical, this is that cobbled surface. We have some geophysical anomalies in there that really run right along this line that we would like to check out as potential for future research. We would also, we also have a really puzzling feature. This is the back of the area between the mansion and the brick kitchen. Again, we've got a really nice cobbled, extensive cobbled surface. And then at one point there's this gray clay deposit that is surrounding something. This is a tree stump from a large tree that was there. The gray clay is right here. So the, we have gray clay sort of surrounding something but the something is under the tree stump. And the clay has a good amount of thickness to it. This is in profile, you can see it sort of tapers, but it's about this thick. And the only place I've seen, one of the places I've seen clay used like this before is in the surround of wells to keep the surface water, um, to keep dirt from the surface from sort of filtering and percolating in through the upper layers of the well um, stonework. So one of the questions is, is there a well, uh, is there a tree growing out of a well here, a former well location? So that would be a, that would be an area to follow up on. We don't know if it would be filled um, or necessarily what period it's from, but I've seen this clay construction in early 19th century estates in Massachusetts. Um, so it could be a leap period feature. And this is also the area where we've found a bunch of Creamware, which is a ceramic that started being produced in the 1760s. So it's a we have a one that's sort of like a molded basket pattern. So it would have been a fancy example of a new stylish ceramic type. And we've got a bunch of it from right around the roots of that tree. So those are areas we'd like to follow up on. And this is the test pit that had Lee period material right at the surface. So one of the things we've learned here is that the Lee deposits across the property are very shallow. So that means they've been very subject to a lot of disturbance. Most of the yard associated with the brick kitchen, so all of this driveway area, blew away the Lee period surface in that area, but it's preserved back here where it was under a woodshed. And it's preserved, you know, in parts here, although there's some utilities. And we've got cobbled surfaces scattered throughout here. There must have been a leap period privy. The north edge next to the 18th cent next to the 19th century privy would be a logical place to look, but we don't we don't have any evidence of that yet. But there must have been one somewhere. Um, so those those are sort of where we go from here. But we have a lot of work still to do on the 2023 collection. 
um, and the material that we have. So this is just sort of tip of the iceberg of results. And I'd like to say thank you very much to the Marblehead Museum for having us for the past couple of years and to um, the field crew and all the people who've worked on this and all the people who have supported the project. So, and we do have some show and tell material. <laughs> And I know it's a little late, but I also have, I can have time for questions if people would like to ask questions. Where were the horses that you carried this year? So, probably in the barn, because although the brick building was early on intended as a carriage house, the study of the structure shows that the carriage doors on that got bricked up very early. So those probably would have been kept in the barn. It's not privy. It's basically a hole in the ground. Is that just more of a ground and then we're broken? Yes, I think it's probably stone lined, the early 18th century one. Um, we don't have, we didn't excavate the whole thing, but there are large stones. So probably a stone lined hole. The later one is brick lined. Um, they can be barrel lined, they can be lined with wood. So you do you do something to reinforce the hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. but, um, how deep were Um a couple feet generally. Yes. Well they got they get cleaned out periodically and the remains taken the material taken out and spread on farm fields. Um but yeah. you mentioned that they could have been covered, they could have been under a building or a building. Yes, usually they would have had a small structure built over them. Okay. Yeah. Like an outhouse. One of the things is when you went up here and I've never dug a hole for a little foot and a half before I didn't get an edge. I can see it. Is that an example or is my well, history unusual? It's, no, it's just really variable. I think the Marblehead geology is variable that way. And then Lee added so much fill yeah. that we're working really in a very artificial urban environment you know for all that that looks nice and grassy and open it's a a really creative environment huh. and it could be uh, an outhouse right it's it no it is it is it an outhouse. outhouse yes okay. yes yeah. yeah yeah and when you're when you're finished with it you yeah. dump all your trash there so all the smelly animal bones um, are also getting discarded there. Okay. <laughs> I have a question uh, in the chat. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> were the um, were the cobbled areas created in any special way? Uh, was there a mortar of some kind, or were the stones nestled into the dirt? So they're not mortared, but they did choose very specifically shaped stones. So they chose sort of flat disc shaped shaped stones, and then they were set in vertically. So they're really tightly packed against one another. Um, and so some of those, the cobbles look kind of small when you see them here, but that's because you're seeing the top edge of a vertical stone. So, so not only did they gather cobbles and haul them up the hill, but they picked through to get the shapes they wanted. Uh, so yeah, huge investment of labor. And you have verified that of the lead here, and it's a it's continuous, but we went through one of the cobble deposits. We went through the cobble deposit in two places to verify that that there weren't Lee period ground surfaces under that. Yes, and in both places where we went through, we came down on that clean fill that Lee added to raise the ground surface, and then the buried seventeen sixty ground surface much deeper. So this is Lee's installation. Yes. Some of them may have been reset. This, this one, which is back here, definitely got disturbed and reset along one edge. But mostly, yes, these are Lee period cobbled surfaces. So. so can people come up and see? Yes, so. yes, we can do show and tell. So I'm going to ask people not to like take anything out of bags, <laughs> but it's because they're all carefully labeled, you know, with where they came from. But yes, if you do show and tell time. Thank you so much.
Yeah. 